Hi, everyone. Thank you very much for joining us uh, today. Uh, we are happy to partner with uh, Thai Delhi uh, to bring about this session. Uh, my name is Elad Hanan, and I work as the Vice President in Silicon Valley Bank. Uh, for those of you who don't know uh, SVB, I will provide a short overview on the company before I present our latest state of the market. So SVB, uh, for those of you, again, uh, who don't know, uh, we have been in business for almost 40 years. Uh, we are uh, based in California, but have since uh, it, it expanded around the world. Uh, we work with companies from early stage uh, through growth and uh, large corporations as well. Uh, as you can see here, we bank uh, over 50% of the US venture-backed uh, technology and healthcare uh, companies, as well as uh, nearly 70% of the US VC firms. So quite a large market share. Uh, I am part of a team called, uh, called Global Gateway, which is a dedicated international business development arm of SVB. Uh, we work with uh, companies and VCs from emerging markets, uh, including Australia, New Zealand, India, Middle East, North Africa, and Latin America. Uh, Priya uh, Rajan, who is the uh, managing director and head of MENA and uh, India in, 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 the, in, the, in the bank, and as well as myself and uh, Arturo Garcia, are the uh, team coverage for uh, in all things India cross-border. Uh, we work with the, these companies and uh, the VCs as they uh, expand their uh, global footprint and as they expand to US and uh, overall uh, global markets. I would like to represent to you at this time the state of the markets, our latest uh, version of it. Uh, we all uh, have seen uh, you know, the tremendous growth uh, that uh, has happened in 2021. And uh, you know, in the slide here, you can also uh, see some of our predictions in going into uh, 2022. Uh, as you can see here, it, we've broken this up to four categories, uh, fundraising, early stage, late stage, and exits. Uh, so you know, as I mentioned earlier, we've experienced a tremendous uh, record-breaking year in 2021 in all fronts. We've seen massive liquidity in the venture ecosystem, uh, higher revenue multiples, high value valuations, and robust IPO and m and activity. As we go into 2022, uh, we are likely to see a, a decrease or what we call a, a healthy downturn in the uh, VC venture ecosystem. Uh, we, that obviously will affect the uh, IPO market, uh, but that said, given the market still needs liquidity, we are uh, expecting to see uh, more activity in the secondary market. When we talk about NFT and Web3, uh, you know, the, 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 we're gonna have a, a steep learning curve. And as we learn more and more about that space, uh, we can for sure say that 2021 has presented a venture investment in Web3 companies uh, which exploded. Uh, we've seen companies like OpenSea Platform uh, that is an NFT marketplace. Uh, we've seen them go from 329 million tra in transaction volume to 3.4 billion uh, in just in one month, really pointing the uh, how dynamic is the sector uh, and how much uh, we're still learning. But you know that said, we will keep an eye on regulation as EU legislators are currently working on laws pertaining to NFTs, and it won't be long until uh, US regulators uh, follow uh, follow suit. Enterprise software has probably been one of the fastest growing sectors uh, globally, uh, and one of the uh, verticals that have benefited benefi benefited a lot from the global pandemic. Uh, as uh, the workforce uh, model has been changing and more and more companies allowing their employees to work from home, uh, businesses uh, are forced to innovate uh, and adopt to uh, new products, uh, which uh, in increases the demand for enterprise software, uh, which uh, really explained the success that this sector had in 2021, but also uh, we're expecting the same uh, success going forward uh, in 2022. Fintech was also one of the uh, beneficiaries of global, the global pandemic. Uh, we've seen fintech industry as a whole uh, getting a large sum of money, getting uh, attracting global investors everywhere. Uh, and fintech as a sector as a whole has uh, pretty matured in, in, in industry in 2021 uh, with the likes of Square and Stripe uh, becoming household names. Uh, you have fintech companies such as the Robinhood, Affirm, Coinbase, 
uh, that are becoming and uh, hitting the public markets as well. Uh, that said, not all fintech segments have been successful. Uh, we also we, we've seen insure tech, uh, for example, that has experienced experienced a bit of struggling. And as we look forward into 2022, we expect crypto uh, to gain more and more attention uh, as you know funding and talent. Uh, floating about uh, makes it feel like a tipping point for new innovation and bottom market acceptance. That really concludes the uh, overview of the state of our latest state of the market uh, brought to you by SVB. Uh, I'm very thrilled to pass uh, the conversation to Priya Rajan, who is the head of uh, MENA in India for Silicon Valley Bank, and Weston Rice, who is the managing director for our software tech banking company, uh, to drive the conversation about venture debt. Thank you, Ella. Thanks, Ella. Thank you, Weston, for taking time. Uh, hi, everyone. Thank you again for joining our Tygon Delhi 2022. Uh, really thrilled to be here with my colleague and dear friend, Weston. Um, Weston, we're going to dive right in. I know we are short on time and we have 20 minutes with you. Let's so we're going to go, uh, we're going to go like fire, fire rounds. And then uh, feel free to, again, uh, add anything that I've missed that you need to address on the venture of debt. Of course. Uh, just let's start from the basics, right? What is venture debt and how does it all work just from the basics? Yeah. Uh, high level venture debt is runway extending uh, cash provided to equity backed businesses. So um, where, where most debt, if you think about it, provided to buildings, restaurants, any, anything else with tangible good, you're lending against an asset. Uh, venture debt is, is purely uh, looking at, at the equity composition of a business and, and understanding kind of who put that money in, how long is it going to carry the business, and, and uh, how much was ultimately raised. And then from there, it's a, it's a pretty simple equation to figure out um, how you drive another quarter or two of operating runway to those cash burning uh, businesses. And why choose debt? Um, why choose venture debt over, yeah. you know, with equity money flowing in, uh, especially significantly into India? Why yeah. choose debt over uh, equity? So it's a good question. And, and I almost would view it as not necessarily choosing it over equity, but more of augmenting that equity. And, and it's it's a little bit of a, of a strange uh, process. You're putting in debt alongside of equity. You're thinking, I'm cash rich today. Why would I take debt? Um, but but if you are a, a, um, a cash burning tech business and you're growing, by definition, at some point, you need to raise capital again. And if your sole source of capital and, and operating cash is from equity, um, it can be tough. If, if there may be a period where um, you are, your cash balance is starting to dwindle, you're looking to raise that next round of capital. And then and then maybe you've lost some momentum in the business, whether that is something happening within the, the, the company itself, or maybe there's something going on in the macro environment that, that may be driving uh, valuations down. Maybe there's a large contract that hasn't materialized in the in the timing you thought. And and if if the only source of capital you have is equity, you may not be able to drive when it is you go and take that equity. So so venture debt you can kind of view it as a as a pre negotiated insurance policy. So you may be able to, as I mentioned earlier, uh, get another three to six months of operating runway, get that momentum you want, and really try to try to take more control over, over, over capital options for your business by having that slug of debt put in place uh, early. And, and how does VCs, I mean, I think, uh, I love how you said it's augmenting and uh, you know, augmenting equity and yeah. not like replacing equity. How do VCs see this as um, a tool yeah. uh, for their portfolio company? Uh, it's a great question. I will try not to speak on behalf of all VCs. Uh, I, I've learned in my, uh, 13 plus years at SVB to not do that. Um, but I will say we uh, this debt is viewed in partnership with equity. And, and if you want to call venture debt what it truly is, it's investor dependent debt. Like I mentioned, we're looking at who put this money in, how much money they put in, and how long is it going to carry the business. And, and it's very important to us when we're looking at venture debt to talk to these investors. Why, why did you put in this money? Help us understand your investment thesis. And then ultimately, what does success look like for this company over the projected runway? Because if we put in debt to support a company that hypothetically, it, it, let's say it's, it's not the right time to put in debt. Um, and, and an example, this may be too much debt. And, and then that next time you're raising money, if an investor would show up and say, look, I, I don't want to deploy my growth equity to pay down debt. It actually puts everyone in a bad spot. The investor, it puts the bank in a bad spot. More importantly, it puts the entrepreneur in a bad spot. So 
we were very careful to put in the right amount of debt and the right structure of debt and not just putting in place debt. So uh, it's a conversation that we have not just with the entrepreneur, but we do very much care about the investor and, and how they view debt as, as part of the overall capital strategy of those portfolio companies. Yeah. And we worked on several of those calls together. And uh, nice. I, I would echo those sentiments from the VCs when I talk to them as well. Uh, again, it's on case by case basis. Absolutely. And uh, absolutely, you need to go double click on each of them to find the right fit. Yeah. You mentioned about the right time. So what is the right time? I know folks listening today are probably now getting excited. Okay, there is maybe another avenue for access to capital. <laughs> yeah. But I want to set the right expectations on avenue to right access to capital. So yeah, what is the and- I've been doing this forever and I, I still don't feel like I've come up with the exact right way to describe this, but the way I'll, I, I will reiterate a point I just mentioned, we're not in the business of pushing debt to companies, um, but we are in the business of pushing information and pushing optionality. And the one thing about venture debt, different than every other bank product out there, is that it's time sensitive. Whereas most, most bank debt and most, most kind of uh, uh, debt-like vehicles, there's an operating covenant, which means so long as a company hits that performance milestone, whether it's a liquidity test or a performance test, you will always have access to that capital. The difference is venture debt. There is no operating covenant. We don't want a young cash burning business to be navigating its company based on the operations and, and the needs of a bank. So what we tell people is there's a bit of time sensitivity around this venture debt. As I mentioned, we are looking at the equity composition of the company. When did you raise it? How much did you raise? And that's a big deal to us. And so what we oftentimes recommend is let's have the conversation right about the exact time you're raising this equity. And we'll tell you the window you have to put it in place. But if you get too far away from that equity round, that cash you raised is now burning down. The sentiment that your investor shared about the excitement they put in may be softening a little bit. So it's not to say that you have to do it the day of, but at least we can set the framework to say, maybe you raise 24 months of cash runway. In the next six months, let's look to, to put something in place if we're going to do it. Because the worst situation is, fat, you know, rewind, where were you? March of 22, go back two years from now. We're all figuring out we're going to work from home. We had these companies that showed up and said, I raised equity two years ago. I'm ready to do it. And we missed the window. So uh, again, pushing information to say there is a bit of time sensitivity here and let us explain to you why that is. And then you and your board, your investors can decide, is this a good strategy and is this the right time? And then we go from there. But there is, there's nothing that we come to show up to, to, to a meeting with a company and say, here's your term sheet today, let's sign up. It's to say, based on what we know of the company and your equity composition, over the next three to six months, give or take, um, this would be a good time to explore this. Thank you. Thank you for being candid. I think uh, two two follow on questions to that one, just so that the context, because the folks listening here today are kind of global audience, but there's a significant portion from India listening in as well. So uh, to clarify, we don't we're not we're not a licensed bank in India, so we Mm -hmm. won't be able to lend into India. So what is the typical structure for the cross border companies um, that you see that come to your table? Yeah, well, I, I think Priya, you you probably taught me this playbook, but I'm I'm happy to talk to you about it from my perspective. So, to your point, I sit in San Francisco, and there is there's a lot of overlap between India and the executives that are are building their companies there and wanting to come into this giant U.S. market, right? And so, um, a couple of things that that we look for that are that are going to be important is um, really if you're going to partner with a bank that is lending you venture debt, unlike a unlike a debt fund, and we can talk about that later but a a bank is going to ask that you move your primary operations to that financial institution. It's just part part of a regulatory uh, uh, narrative to say, like, if you're going to lend this debt, stay close to the collateral, stay close to the company. Now, if a company is uh, 100% managed and 100% running in India with no expectation of coming to the United States, you don't want to move your financial operations to Silicon Valley Bank to where you're going to constantly be having to move money back and forth. It's not an efficient means. Like, we, we really value looking at relationships where we can add value beyond the debt. And so we talk to these, to, these, uh, to these executives and say, if you're planning on coming to the United States, let's talk about what that road plan looks like. Let's talk about, um, is this something your board isn't encouraging too? And, and maybe you're raising from a, your series A or B may have a lead or a, a, a new investor from the United States that is encouraging you or helping you get into this new market. And uh, there's just a couple things we do want to understand maybe where that intellectual property sits or is planning to sit. We want to understand the roadmap for 
um, how you plan on building customers, building an office, building a team here in the United States. And, and, and much as, as we mentioned earlier, we want to get that sense for where's the company today? Where are you going? And we can very quickly set the framework to say, you know, whether it's us or a partner either in the U.S. or in India, there's a lot of different tools in the debt world. And our job is to help you understand what those are and then really understanding how to maximize the value of that debt as part of your overall capital strategy. Did I answer your question, right. by the way? That's, that's perfect. That's perfect. I just wanted to reiterate that the folks listening in, you know, you would need to have a Delaware entity, I would say, as a starting point um, and need a U.S. denominated kind of a banking need, right? Because a lot of the questions that I do get is, hey, I need an INR debt. Can I get? Unfortunately, not. So I just that's one of the main things I wanted to clarify. Um, I would even offer a little bit, maybe if I can add on to what Weston is saying, Please. you know, uh, you know, where if you're thinking of venture to, uh, raising an equity capital, talk talk to me and Ella, who you heard before, even before raising your equity round, because that's kind of where we can even start that relationship early on to uh, get you to when there is a venture that need, we can obviously loop in the right team members, including Weston. So I think that's where uh, the criticality comes in. Um, so Weston, just what you mentioned about equity raise, what is an equity raise? Like, what do you define? When is the right time for that? Is that because now it seems like all these numbers are kind of shifting upwards. Um, so what's the minimum that folks need to raise? Or is there any set of who they need to raise yeah. to qualify? Or maybe maybe not? No, it's a great question. And and I don't want to skirt by something you just said, and that's talking to your team. If, if you're an entrepreneur building a business, surround yourself with partners that understand what it takes to scale a tech company. And, and I think SVB is very good at what we do. We're very plugged in, but also we have partners in all, in all areas of this tech ecosystem to help you grow, whether that's commercial insurance here in the United States, whether that's moving money internationally, we can help. We have partners that can help. Um, you want to build a network of trusted advisors around your company so you can focus on the things most critical, hiring the right people, building your software efficiently, and going and winning customers. Like You don't want to spend a bunch of time trying to explain to a bank what SaaS stands for. That is not a good use of your time. So um, you mentioned something earlier, Priya, about talking to you early. Everything that we do at Silicon Valley Bank is meant to be proactive in terms of showing up and saying, um, you can do that, but maybe here's something. We, we work with the majority of U.S. tech companies that, that have gone public the last several years, so we can extrapolate backwards and say, the most successful companies we see up here did this early. Maybe it's something to think about. And so if we can help you set the framework to scale efficiently, we should. And that's what your team has done beautifully for these cross-border businesses. And, and this dovetails into the narrative around, like, when is the right time? And, and I think the conversation, it, you can never do it too early. And so let's, let's run through a hypothetical scenario. If you were saying, I want to raise $10 million in capital for my business to scale it to reach X amount in ARR, or whatever, whatever those milestones of success are going to look like, well, you go raise $10 million in equity, or you could potentially do $8 million in equity and give or take $2 million in debt. And, and our typical framework is 20 to 25% of your equity raise and runway extending um, debt. So if you've already thought that $10 million is the right amount, Maybe, maybe that is a good conversation, but if you've already locked in 10 in equity, my guess is your, your investors are not going to say, sure, we'll take $2 million back. They, they're very excited to deploy that money into your business. So we're always here. It is literally our job to have those conversations early to say, if you do this, then maybe this is where SVB could come in and, and step up. So we're fast at those conversations. We've been doing this for a long time. And, and again, it is equipping you with information to understand your options. Um, but uh, for, for companies on that equity round, typically think it's, I usually say 20 to 30% of what you raise in runway extending capital that, that oftentimes translates to one to two, maybe slightly more quarters of operating runway. Today's capital world is a little weird, so it's, it's changing. But um, in, in terms of like the equity composition, it also kind of matters who it is. Right. And, and I know this sounds odd, but um, uh, if, if I were to start a business and my uncle back in Arkansas and my aunt in Texas showed up and said, we're going to help fund this business, Silicon Valley Bank is going to look at that and say, those individuals have no vested interest in Silicon Valley Bank and the relationship that, that we would expect mm -hmm. to have to be a good partner alongside of this company. Now, if you flip to, let's say, Nexus, yeah. Nexus is a firm that we have a global relationship with. We've got it in the US, we've got it in India. We have worked across countless portfolio companies. And when we sit down to talk about venture debt with them, we say, you know, this is our understanding of the business, what their goals are. We're talking to them about runway extending venture debt. Here are some thoughts. 
We have done this, I, Priya, you'll know more than I will, but I, I can't even tell you how many times. And what is important there is not necessarily this transaction, but the dozens of transactions we have before and that are in place today. And when things go bump in the night in the economy or something may be going bad for this like one particular company, that is the relationship of these two big organizations, Silicon Valley Bank and Nexus, that is the value of this relationship. And not if you know my aunt and uncle say, you know what, Weston's company's not working, we're out, good luck SVB. There's no historical relationship. So when, when we say that it matters, we're usually looking for institutional investors that have got um, some similar limits and understanding of to say, this is how much we put in and maybe we have reserves and these are the expectations to access those. So I don't wanna say go raise 4 million bucks and we're in, that's not a, it's too simplistic. So it is a little bit of who those investors are, but, but a conversation we're always willing to have. No, well said. Jishnu is probably feeling the itch right now, <laughs> talking about Nexus, but all things good, Jishnu. Uh, with that said, I think, uh, uh, well said, uh, absolutely the right approach to go through. Uh, you mentioned SaaS. Uh, as you know, there's a strong yeah. kind of uh, strong set of companies coming from India that are looking into the U.S. market that are SaaS. And you work a, with a significant portion of them, if not all. Yeah. So what are some of the metrics, if at all, you could share uh, I mean, it, not necessarily the numbers, because numbers depends on the stages these companies come in. Yeah. What are some of the basic things that you would typically look at as you go through uh, putting a term sheet? It's a, it's a great question. And, and one thing I'll mention about the, kind of the, the debt playbook. It is easy for us to talk to startups to say, this is what venture debt is. And it is for oftentimes early stage companies. It's their first introduction to venture debt. Now, as a company grows, and their performance starts to show up, we can now, as opposed to just lending against the equity composition, we can now lend against performance as well. So um, as a company grows, and we've got to always do, we've got to, we've got to be better at this all the time, is, is setting the playbook in front of these companies that says, as you grow and as you evolve, um, here are things that also, that also show up as a, as a tool potentially for you to use. So whether that's an MRR-based line of credit, and typically as a company, I would say reaches eight to $10 million in ARR, they could get a recurring revenue-based line of credit, which on top of venture debt, you start to expand the tools that you have to augment the growth of the business where, you know, uh, venture debt does take a very small piece of equity as part of their composition because there's no operating covenant. Um, the lines of credit, there is a covenant in place, but there's no warrant component. But that's because the company has reached a level of scale that's, that is that is warrants that the, it can cover the exposure of the debt in and of itself. So, to answer your questions on the metrics that are important, um, I, would, I would imagine that most of what we're looking at is very aligned with what the investors are looking at. And, and a lot of that is around the ability to not just win companies, but retain them. And if I'm assuming we're talking about SaaS companies, it's that um, not, every company, not every contract needs to be multi hundred thousand dollars. If you're selling to enterprise, great. But if you were selling to smaller companies, how efficient are you in selling? And then once they land, what about your client retention rates? Or what about your land and expand? If you're going from a product-led growth strategy, how are you in terms of getting in front of those first users and then expanding into a broader enterprise? And I think a lot of what entrepreneurs are doing, you're building a vision. And when you're talking to entrepreneurs or talking to Silicon Valley Bank and saying, this is this amazing software, and this is how we want to get it in the hands of customers. I mean, that's by definition a successful business. The, the nuances around that, you know, balance sheet centric things, efficiency of cash, I, I think those things typically work themselves out. If it's something you're not very confident in, there's a lot of people out there you can bring in to help. So most of what we're focused on, most of what, you know, we're looking at is going to be on that income statement. What's that MR, what are those MRR trends? How efficient are you in bringing it in and then retaining it? And then beyond that, whether it's the specifics of a, a particular business in that, in that industry, who knows what that may be. Um, it, it's just make sure there's an alignment between you and your board members on what success looks like and, and track those metrics each board meeting so that you can talk about where there's success. And, and if there is room for, for growth or improvement, you know, talk to, talk to you, talk to me about um, are there folks out there that you know that may help in, or, or may have a good insight into whatever that particular need may be. Great. Uh, you know, how, how about the competitive landscape? Like, uh, I know that there's, uh, from a pricing perspective, how do, how do we stand uh, in, in comparison to others and, or may not even be comparison to others? How do you even price, um, you know, a venture debt in this current environment? Yeah, well, our prices win every time. Uh, <laughs> don't ask anyone else. Uh, of course. It's, a, it's, a, it's a fair question. Um, so venture debt, for the, for the general composition of venture debt, um, 
the, 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 the key attributes of venture debt are this. It's how much money do you get? That's back order, yeah. right? You don't want to fight over a $10,000 loan. Um, it's how long do you have to decide whether or not you want to use it? So when I mentioned you put it in place alongside of equity, you typically don't have to draw any of it. You may have 12 to 18 months in your draw period. So that is 18 months to decide if you even want to use it. Most companies never draw it down. It is that pre-negotiated insurance policy that is there to use, but you may not need to use it. It's great if you don't. Um, The interest rate, our our typical, I'm going to ballpark and say 5%. Um, is our is our average somewhere between five and six? It's very competitive market, so likely in the five, slightly more range. But if there's nothing funded on your loan, there is no interest payment. So um, it, that's an it's an interesting thing to know and to to negotiate. But if there's nothing funded on your loan, I would probably deprioritize that. The other part of this is the warrant. Now, as I mentioned, there's no operating covenant, so we are taking equity like risk. So we get a small equity piece of our composition, or excuse me, our compensation. And in our typical approach, ooh, you got to be careful saying this on a recorded call, is somewhere going to be probably between 20 and 30 basis points, which is, you know, one fifth of 1% of fully diluted ownership and about half of that at close. And so if the overall composition, there's no, we don't have like an upfront fee or things like that for loans, but granted, everything is nuanced for the particular business and the particular opportunity. But from the overall compensation perspective, if you gave up, let's say, 18% of your company for that Series A, and let's say that's you know a $10 million Series A, and we're giving you another $3 million in debt, but we want 12 basis points to close, you, you went from having $10 million of equity for 18% of your company to $13 million of capital for 18.12%. And, and to me, you know, that, that's the conversation that, that an entrepreneur and their board member has to have to say, is this worth it? Is this something worth putting in place? And, and, and to us, again, we're not in the position of pushing debt. We have, you know, the bank's doing great. Um, and, and I think that it is worth exploring. There are a lot of other players out there. There are debt funds that have, they can get slightly more creative, but their cost is slightly higher. We are a commercial bank, so we make a little bit of money across this whole relationship. So we actually keep our debt prices down, but they may have a bit more flexibility. So we will oftentimes make introductions to other partners so that you can understand what the best option is, not just the SVB option. We're always looking for what's the best option for them uh, exactly. and what's the long-term option. So this is just the start of the journey. And uh, Weston, you and your team are with the company all the way through the finish line. So that is the value that cannot be kind of compensated with any little pricing differential that you'll get. Uh, I know we're right at time. I just wanted to say a huge thanks. So for the folks listening, if you the last part I know was a bit more complicated. So if you do have questions, feel free to ping us. We're here to help you. And, uh, you know, hopefully uh, any questions you have, either you can DM us on Twitter or LinkedIn and happy to address any questions on venture debt. Uh, again, Weston, thank you so much for taking time. I appreciate, as always, uh, your partnership. Thank you, Priya. Thanks, Ella. Right, take care. Bye-bye.